So thank you for welcoming me, welcoming me to the seminar today. Very briefly, for anyone unfamiliar with PLOS, Public Library of Science, uh, we were established in 2001 and published our first journal in 2003. In 2006, we established the first interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary mega journal, PLOS One, and um, PLOS One was innovative in not selecting research for publication based on the perceived impact or importance of the research and publishes all scientifically sound research uh, in the journal. We now publish 12 journals, uh, having launched several new titles such as PLOS Global Public Health and PLOS Climate in 2021. Uh, but as well as being proponents of open access publishing, uh, we're also renowned for promoting the availability of research data via our strong data availability policy, which is the focus of my talk today. So I'm going to talk about the impact of the policy, also some of the challenges that we've tried to overcome in managing this policy, and also what we've learned from operating this policy for many years and what opportunities we see that this is creating to support further innovation in open science. So a brief history of PLOS's data availability policy, which applies to all of the journals that we publish. So PLOS journals have always required data sharing as a condition of publication. And we launched our first journal back in 2003. However, in 2014, the policy was updated to require public data sharing for every research article we publish, and also for every research article to include a data availability statement or a DAS, which is now quite common in, in many more journals. Why did we introduce the policy uh, or why have we always had the policy? It is to increase the availability of and access to research data. And why do we want that? That is because that will help to advance scientific progress if more of research outputs are available openly. In terms of what data the policy applies to, authors are required to share the research data that would enable replication of the results reported in the article that they are publishing in PLOS journals. To summarize the requirements of the policy for authors that are submitting to our journal, now the research data supporting results of articles must be made publicly available unless there are legitimate legal or ethical restrictions on sharing that data. So some articles are published in PLOS journals that don't have publicly available data for legal or ethical reasons. Every paper that's submitted since March 2014 must include this data availability statement, and that statement is available to peer reviewers as well as editors before the article is published. We strongly encourage that data are shared in public repositories, but ultimately it's up to the researcher to determine how their data are shared. We strongly encourage other good practices, such as linking data to publications and the citation of data sets in reference lists and the use of data management plans. So what have been some of the outcomes of the policy since we introduced it in 2014? We've observed several outcomes that can be correlated with or were caused by the implementation of the policy. The first outcome I want to highlight is based on an independent analysis of PLOS articles. And this shows that the proportion of PLOS articles that include this data availability statement increased dramatically after the updated policy was introduced in 2014. As the policy was introduced for all submitted articles in 2014, by around 2016, we can see that nearly all papers included this data availability statement. 
we have also been able to observe how frequently different data sharing approaches are being used by authors when we analyze PLOS articles. There are three main approaches to data sharing that we can see happening. The first one is sharing of data in a repository. The second one is sharing data in the paper or as supporting information files or supplementary material, it's sometimes called. The third kind is sharing data privately, where there are those legal or ethical restrictions on data sharing. Now, sharing data in repositories is the preferred approach. It's considered best practice. But as we can see, it is not so far the most common approach for sharing data. In PLOS, about two thirds of authors publishing in our journals share data via supporting information. Sharing some data on this graph from a little more recently, we can see that looking at these three different methods of sharing data to the end of 2021, more and more authors are beginning to share data in repositories. So by 2021, 31% of authors publishing in our journals are now using a data repository. The same study that I cited on the previous slide by Kolovitsa et al. Uh, also found that the papers that are sharing data in a repositories could expect to attract 25% more citations to those papers than the papers that were sharing data by other methods. So while sharing data in a repository might be a bit more work for some of our authors, authors it, it is clear that there are certainly a number of benefits of authors making their data available in the manner which is more compatible with the FAIR principles. So in summary, what have we learned from implementing the policy, both in terms of the benefits and the costs? So it's clear that mandatory data availability policies are effective and they have benefits, which is seen by the high level of compliance that we have with the policy since it was introduced. To give you some context, other studies of data policies have found that optional data sharing policies, policies that are not mandatory, might only see about a 5% level of compliance. But mandatory policies do incur costs. Historically, at PLOS, it is about 25 minutes of extra work per article we publish on average to implement our data availability policy. And one of our challenges is working to increase the efficiency with which we can continue to do that. It's also clear that researchers need support to understand and comply with journal data availability policies. Our guidelines on our website are very highly accessed and we have gone through multiple revisions to the guidelines we provide to authors to comply with our policy and are planning further updates to them next year. We've also learned from conducting our own research, such as interviews and surveys, uh, we've also learned how important data sharing is to different researchers and also how important data access is to different researchers. But we've also learned that different groups of researchers, different research communities have different needs and they also use different solutions for sharing data. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the second half of my talk. So in the second half of my presentation, I will discuss what we're doing now and what we can do next to support further adoption of best practices in data sharing. So as previously noted, a goal of PLOS is to measurably increase the use of data repositories by our authors as the method for data sharing, because this is considered the best practice. It is more compatible with the FAIR principles, which Ingrid uh, very well described. So to help us at PLOS determine how we should actually go about achieving this goal of increasing use of repositories, we conducted some research, uh, which was a survey of nearly 700 researchers, which we published uh, in 2021. In our research, we found that researchers are 
satisfied with their own ability to share data, despite data repositories being the least common method for public data sharing by the respondents to our survey. This suggests to us there is a lack of awareness still of the benefits of using repositories. We also found that more than half, 52% of researchers reuse other researchers' data regularly in their own research. But respondents to our survey reported that they were dissatisfied with their ability to access other researchers' data, despite being satisfied with their own ability to share their data. One conclusion we drew from these results was that if we want to increase use of data repositories, we need to offer researchers solutions for sharing and reusing data that require minimal effort, minimal extra work for them to adopt. And so in 2021 to 2023, PLOS is testing two solutions that aim to increase use of data repositories and or increase access to research data. And the solutions that I'm going to tell you about next are in part possible through to some grant support that we received from the Wellcome Trust. So the first solution we are testing is the Dryad Generalist Data Repository, which has been seamlessly integrated into the existing journal submission experience of the journal PLOS Pathogens. It offers a data repository option to authors during the manuscript submission process and aims to steer authors towards best practice with minimal effort. Authors do not need to leave the journal's submission process to use the repository, and we aim for authors to use this option instead of uploading data as supporting information files. Importantly, PLOS is also paying the fees that would ordinarily be payable to Dryad by authors for their data hosting and curation service. We want to remove as many barriers as possible to best practice in data sharing. And so covering the costs is one part of doing that. I should note that other publishers, for example, Springer Nature, are conducting similar experiments with general repositories as well. Uh, examples include Figshare uh, as, as another repository that can be integrated with different submission systems. The next slide um, is a image of what the integrated repository experience looks like for authors submitting to PLOS pathogens. As part of our project, we also tested different configurations of this screen and different terminologies to describe research data with the aim of trying to increase the likelihood that authors would use the integrated data repository. The second solution that we are testing is a prominent visual link or a badge that appears on published articles. This solution actually has two objectives. The first is the same as the Dryad solution insofar as it is to encourage or incentivize more researchers to share data in a repository. But the second goal importantly is to increase, increase access to and ultimately reuse of research data that are linked to PLOS articles. To achieve these two goals, we developed a fully automated experimental solution that provides a prominent visual link or a badge on published articles that link via their data availability statement to data that have been shared in repositories. And I will show you an image on the next slide. The intention of this solution is to meet researcher needs relating to data discovery and reuse, as well as offering a type of badging reward, which were first introduced by the Center for Open Science. And these badges have been proven to work in terms of increasing data sharing in other contexts. And there is a citation for one of those studies on the slide. We worked with a user experience design consultancy, design experts using an iterative testing process to optimize the designs we chose for this link um, with the goal of making it as enticing as possible for researchers to want to click to access the data. We don't have all of our results to share yet because this is still a live experiment, but we will do so next year. This is what the final design looks like. 
And this button, this see the data button is live on about 3000 published PLOS articles currently. We've so far observed well over 7,000 clicks on the see the data button. And we are also observing a potential correlation between articles having this badge on them and increased views of data sets that are linked to these articles in the Figshare repository. I should add that the, these are preliminary results and, and they need further validation. In addition to these experiments we're conducting to increase best practices in data sharing, PLOS is collaborating with numerous other organizations, including other publishers, importantly, to promote and support implementation of effective data availability policies. We're happy to share that we're happy to share what we've learned over the last few years in implementing our policies, both the failures as well as the successes. Some examples of activities that we are involved with include the Research Data Alliance, the RDA. There is a data policy standardization and implementation interest group, which I am one of the co-chairs of. One of the outputs of this group has been to produce detailed guidance on designing and implementing journal data policies. And these guidelines, which are published, have been reused many times by journals and publishers, including the STM Association. STM has a research data committee, which launched in 2019. And this group is supporting increased adoption of data policies at many other journals and publishers. PLOS and other publishers are also part of a group called fairsharing.org, which promotes common approaches to policies and common standards for data sharing. Furthermore, the PLOS publication corpus is regularly used for meta research on data sharing policy and practice. And the paper that I was talking about earlier in my presentation by Kolovitsa et al. is just one example of research that has been done on PLOS articles about data sharing policies. In nearly reaching the end of my presentation, a summary of what is next uh, for PLOS's data availability policy that I have talked about today. So firstly, we want to measurably increase adoption of best practice in data sharing, that is use of data repositories. And we also want to measurably increase the benefits of data sharing, such as reuse of research data. And we're conducting experiments and implementing new features to try and achieve this. We're also collaborating with other stakeholders, including publishers and funders, to share our experiences of managing a strong data sharing policy and to accelerate progress in data sharing. We're also conducting our own research into how we can support different research communities and journals in more specific ways. And we also share the results of this research uh, as preprints, as data sets, and as peer-reviewed articles. And finally, we will soon begin proactively sharing and publishing data on our own progress towards increasing best practices in data sharing. And we're also measuring and will share our progress on supporting other open science practices, which I'll show you on my last slide. So to explain this a little more, a few weeks ago, PLOS announced a new project, which we've called Open Science Indicators. And these open science indicators are measurements of four key open science practicals, practices in articles that POS publishes, including, importantly, how many articles share data in a repository. This project is a collaboration with an organization called Dataseer, and it's using an artificial intelligence-based method to measure open science practices in all of our articles back to 2019. So that's about 70,000 articles. As well as measuring the proportion of our articles that share data in a repository, very important for today's discussion, we're also calculating and will publish the rates of code sharing in PLOS articles, the rates of preprint posting, by PLOS articles, and in 2023, we will also share rates of protocol sharing by PLOS articles. We're doing this for a few reasons. Uh, we want to take an evidence-based approach to how we can remove barriers to wider adoption of open science practices, 
And if we want to do that, then we need to get better at measuring and understanding these practices. This information about open science indicators will help us at PLOS understand the researchers that we serve better. It will help identify ways to support them better. And it will also help us understand how effective solutions are at increasing adoption of these practices. We also plan to make all of the data underlying these open science indicators open starting from next month. And we're providing this data to the community, including all of you, researchers, funders, publishers and institutions, because we hope that providing this reliable information on open science might empower other stakeholders to also take action to help make open science practices the norm. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, that is my email address, and I will stop sharing my screen and listen for any questions. Thank you for your attention.